with an interest in the Essex Boys case will have known of the name Mickey Bowman from Donna Jaggers' statement as the one who lent Pat, Tony and Craig a machine gun, apparently for the planned plane robbery. But on a recent post on an Essex Boys Facebook group, David McKelvey from private investigation company TMI left this comment, which states, Essex police have another undisclosed call. This one between Mickey Bowman and Tony Tucker at 17.07 on the 6th of December. Just under two hours from the time of the murders, according to self-confessed liar Darren Nichols. But when Steve Nipperellis was in prison, he met with Mickey Bowman, who gave Nipper a good enough reason not to like Tony Tucker. The following is from Nipper's book, Last Man Standing. After a game of baseball one day, I'd been walking back across the sports field towards the wing with a baseball bat resting on my shoulder. I'd hung a bag containing the ball, gloves and various other items we'd been using to play on the end of the bat. As we reached the door to the wing, someone had said, I'll see you later, Steve. And another voice behind me had added, yes, and I will see you too, Steve. It sounded like a veiled threat to me, so I turned around and said to the person behind me, who the fuck are you? I'm Mickey, Pat Tate's mate, he replied. When I raised the bat in readiness to launch Mickey's head across the prison yard, the bag of accessories slid down the shaft of the bat and onto my wrist. Feeling somewhat foolish, I threw the bag onto the floor and swung the bat backwards in readiness to strike. Billy Archer grabbed me and began shouting, Whoa, whoa, Nipper, leave out, he's all right. Mickey raised his open hands to indicate there was no threat of violence, so I lowered the bat. Mickey introduced himself as Mad Mickey Bowman from South London and said that he'd only been joking about being a friend of Pat Tate. Me and Billy Archer are here because of a bit of business that we're going to do with Tate and his mate Tucker. I don't trust the geezers, Mickey said. He told me that he and Billy had arranged to meet Tate and Tucker at the Happy Eater restaurant in Basildon, the fast food outlet that Tate had robbed many years earlier. I have no idea what Billy and Mickey were planning to do that involved Tate and Tucker, but Mickey did tell me when they arrived to the meeting, he initially smelt a rat. Call it intuition, a sixth sense, whatever. It just didn't feel right. So I said to Billy, let's get the fuck out of here. Billy thought that Mickey was just being paranoid and tried to reassure him that everything would be okay. Billy reversed his vehicle into a parking bay and the two men then waited for the arrival of Tucker and Tate. When there was no sign of them after 30 minutes, Billy looked across at Mickey in the passenger seat and said, you're right, mate. Something stinks. Let's get out of here. As Billy started up the engine and prepared to drive out of the car park, several armed police officers jumped out the back of a nearby van and surrounded his car. I have no idea what, if anything, the police found in his vehicle, but Billy and Mickey found themselves on remand in HMP Chelmsford, awaiting trial. They certainly didn't need to employ the services of Sherlock Holmes to work out they'd been set up, and neither man was very happy about it. While in HMP Chelmsford, Billy and Mickey were reliably informed by none other than Pat Tate that had been Tucker who had been responsible for their arrest. According to Tate, Tucker had heard that Billy and Mickey were intent on taking part of his business over and so decided to have them removed. I cannot say if Tate was simply blaming Tucker to deflect blame from himself. Alone and in prison, it can be dangerous if other inmates think you're an informant. Billy and Mickey chose to believe Tate and good intentions between the men were restored. So why, if Mickey Bowman had good reason not to like or trust Tony Tucker, why would he have lent them a machine gun and also attended Tony's birthday? But what was the phone call about on the evening of the murders? In Mick Bowman's police interviews, he never confesses to lending the free, the machine gun, but does mention having been in the Range Rover, a week before the murders took place. David McKelvey goes on to say, could this Mick, that Donna Jaggers mentions Mickey the pilot, could this instead have been Mickey Bowman? Later changed by the Essex police to suit the narrative set by the 28 statements of Darren Nichols. In his police interview, Mickey Bowman was asked, what his reaction was when he'd first heard 
that Pat, Tony and Craig had been murdered. Cool, frightened, mate. Frightened the life out of me. Because he said he was going to give me a ring. He said we we're going to go and have a drink or something. Just before Christmas. Then all of a sudden, bang, he's gone. I heard it on the radio, I think. And I thought, three fellas in a Range Rover. And I was in the Range Rover. And I thought, that ain't right. Frightened the life out of me. So you've been in the Range Rover? Well, that's what I thought. I thought I've been in that car when I've been having a drink. I might have been fucking flopped on myself. Frightened. Frightened the life out of me. What'd you do? So how many times have you actually been in the Range Rover? More than... I think I've been in it once or twice. And where were you sitting in the Range Rover? I can't remember. Have you ever driven it? No, no, never driven it. Have you ever been in the front passenger seat? I think so, yeah. I might have squeezed in the back and I've... Just as a matter of formality, I'd appreciate if you could give us some help on this one. Patrick, Pat, Tony and Craig were murdered on the evening on the 6th of December, which was a Wednesday evening. I appreciate it was some time ago. Can you tell me where you were in that particular time? Um, I'm not sure. Debbie will know. I'll meet her. Can't remember. I really can't. Do you keep a diary or anything like that? No. Debbie would remember though, because I think I went... Did I... Was I with me mum and dad? Her mum and dad? Her mum and dad came down. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think I had dinner with her mum and dad. I'm not sure on that night. I remember that night I was at home. I think they came down to see me. I had my daughter on the sick that day because I was spooked. It spooked me a little bit and I think I kept her on Wednesday, most Wednesdays. I just want to say to you, the bodies were found on the 7th, on Thursday the 7th. Yeah. Okay, in the morning. So what we're interested really is about the night before that. Right. I really can't remember at this stage. I remember the day. I think... I think, like, my daughter came over and I uh, collected her about four. I can't remember that day. Well, obviously, as if, as you were saying, that you were obviously spooked when you heard the news that day. Mm -hmm. That uh, does not give you an inkling that you think, cool, blind me, I could have been with them that night if you'd have been out and, like, give you a bit of a clue of what you were doing. Well, I wasn't out drinking the night before. No, it's not what I'm saying. But when you said before, you could have been out with them. Well, what I'm saying, if I was in that car and I went out and actually had a drink with them and I was in the car that they had been assassinated in, they had not how to work out. It's frightening, isn't it, really? I mean, fuck me. I've got form in that. I ain't no cunt. But I ain't, you know, like, I could have been going out somewhere drinking and been roped into something with those because I know them. Mickey Bowman was never interviewed about this phone call between him and Tony Tucker on the evening of the murders. That's not to say that this phone call means that Mick Bowman had anything to do with the murders or even getting him down the lane that evening. But if Michael Bowman was the fourth passenger in the Range Rover that evening, would that mean that Tony, Pat and Craig would have trusted Michael enough not to have any weapons with them? An Essex police failing to interview Mickey Bowman over the phone call with Tony, the second undisclosed phone call from the Essex police, the second one being at 18.27 between said person and Pat Tate. With Essex police holding back these calls, even to the non-suspicious mind, makes you think, were these calls connected to the murders in some way?